Hi everyone, this is Max and I'm here today with the European Time Zone Meetup Group and we're going to be reading selections from Lainey Brown's Daily Sonnets. We're going to start with 614 Dunn Sonnet. I am a liturgy worsted made cupidity of elixir and angelica spumone. I am a minute orb made subtly of rudiments and innocent goblin. I am a little live oak made cupbearer of Elizabethan and angstrom sprawl. The next is two fourteenths sonnet. This undressing at security checkpoints would never have gone over with the Victorians. And now, an untitled. In Chinese astrology, you are a snake, but at home you are a kitty knight. You don't have any bunny in your body. You ate a bunny, but you're not a bunny king. To make a person, you need two people. Otherwise, you'll just get a big belly and the baby will never hatch. Your favorite food is syrup. Jewel Jim the pig, our pet caterpillar, red, gray, yellow, and black, is searching for a bramble leaf to eat. My rice bowl is not full. Jacob kicked me in the top of my nose. We pushed each other off of the couch. And the last one, I'm a bunny in a human suit, so people don't try to eat me when I go shopping. Is it not winter at his house? Daytime never ends. What is that living in our curtain, gray and yellow and red? Our neighbor rakes a tree. Does an apple cry done going down? Mm -hmm. So who is this Lainey Brown? No. <laughs> <laughs> ah, yes. Uh, Did you share the screen, Max? No, I I sent the I shared the link um, oh. in the chat. Okay. You can. Open what it was the chat. first one that you read? I I, I had. This one is the six fourteenth uh, Dunn sonnet. I am a liturgy worsted made cupidity of elixir and angelica spumoni. I am a minute orb made subtly of rudiments and innocent goblin. I'm a little live oak made cupbearer of Elizabethan and angstrom sprawl. So it's it's six lines, hence the title six fourteenths, the so six fourteenths of a sonnet. Um, this was also a little bit, these poems were briefly discussed in the webcast the other day. So there's a little bit of a conversation about um, simplifying the fractions. So Laney calls it the six fourteenth sonnet and the two fourteenth sonnet rather than the three sevenths and the one seventh sonnet which is what, it should, you know, mathematically would be more elegant. Um, but uh, I guess she's making, in some ways, maybe this is easier to understand. I think maybe if you call it the one seven sonnet, people would have, uh, it would make less sense. I don't know. Um, well, I think it would make much less sense because the 14th connects it to the sonnet, doesn't it? Of course, yeah. Hence the, right. So so Ooh. we know it's a 14 or a 14 line. Um home so yeah so keeping keeping that 14 intact mm. it's like you know helps us grasp it but yeah so the we have these two the first two which are these sort of fractions of sonnets and then the last two i read are are actually um 14 line sonnets even though they're not um they're not formally uh, aside from being 14 lines they're not formally traditional um, sonnets insofar as they don't have the that kind of ABBA rhyme scheme or the um, uh, any kind of regular meter as far as I can tell. Um, yeah, I mean, the Dunn uh, what, what I liked uh, best was your confusion about the first one. Um, is it page 60 or what is the 60? Um, this is the page. Um, Usually, uh, sonnets are numbered in, in cycles, so it is number 60. And at the same time, it's also page 60. Yes. Where was the page number? Here is the page number. And even that is a feature of, of the sonnet, uh, the, the publication, that you publish um, a sonnet on only one page. Right. And um, what's great is... This one here, um, the 214th sonnet, only two lines on one page. 
indicating that there is so much meaning behind that that is um that, that these poems are so powerful and this is also true for uh, Lainey Brown yeah I think that there's a kind of elegance to to the fact that it can or should fit on a single page um somebody else wanted to was it Terry I'm sorry I was maybe looking away from my screen somebody else was maybe beginning no okay was some no okay <laughs> um oh, yeah. oh I the only thing I wanted to say was and I, I mean I just kept saying this stuff to myself um you said uh cupid you you try to rhyme uh sub subtly sub subtly cupidity sub Subtly, we say it in English. That's a word. That's a hard word for us. Subtly. And and you were trying to rhyme it with cupidity, and then you tried to rhyme Elizabethan with it too. Elizabeth when you first read it, Elizabethan with um... uh, subtly cupidity. Cupidity is not really. I mean, that's a, a neologism, right? And um, uh, subtle, subtly. So that would be A, B, A, B. So when it came to A again, subtly, cupidity, you tried to make cupidity. Ah, yeah. You tried to, you stumbled over that word trying to, you actually were mm -hmm. trying to make it match. Just, it's it's interesting. It was an interesting hearing. That's, uh, that's a hard yeah. word. But I think I think that's also just what these you know familiar forms invite, right? Like you start to. That's right. It's it's the form that did it. It wasn't your uh, dyslexia or your uh, yeah. list or whatever you else you have. Yeah. It wasn't that. <laughs> it was. It... Yes, but uh, is it is it the quadrant? And of course, most of her lines don't have ten syllables, so that makes it much harder if you're thinking sonnet. It, it, it. The first one has 13, and then the second one has 11. Yeah. So you, you can't make them into pairs. <laughs> and then I, I don't... I don't think it's it's a quadrant, um, as, as we have in, in an English sonnet. I think it's it's only a couplet, um, two lines. And then she starts again. She um, has three um, attempts of creating something that's comparable to John Donne. Mm. It, it's always the, the same. Uh, if there's a parallelism of I am something, of something, and the rest. Oh, uh, yeah. My bit of playing says that in the first one and the third one, she used N+, plus, but she never used N+, plus the same number of words. Not in my dictionary, anyway. And then in, in the middle one, I think she must have done that with a thesaurus, because they're, all the changes in the middle couplet are words that you'd pick up if you just look at Dunn's original in the thesaurus. The the middle couplet, I am a minute orb made somewhere? Yes. Yes, that one, all of that one, um, which doesn't start with the same letters like the first and third one do, so they can't be N pluses. I think they're simply thesaurus ones because all those come in, thesaur in a thesaurus. You can get all those words in a thesaurus. I had loads and loads and loads of fun with this, um, with the dictionary in a thesaurus and working out mm. how I thought she might have done it. And then making a kind of a translation because I had to look up some words because I didn't know what they meant. And once I got yeah. into that, I looked up all her words. And then I had this completely wonderfully mad, um, what I've called 614 done sonnet undressed because it just, it's just translations of the words. I've I've posted the the source text here in the in the right. Um, the... So Jenny, do you have your thing that you could read? Yes, it it might be a bit up and down because I've done all sorts of crossings out, but I I can do, and all the words I've used are direct translations of of meanings of her words from dictionaries. So I'm a celebration of Eucharist, beaten and made covetous of a liquid with the power of indefinitely prolonging life and a defence against poison and pestilence, an ice cream layered in different colours. 
I'm a very tiny ring carrying celestial bodies in their revolutions around the earth, made artfully of the simplest principles of a subject and a mischievous sprite in bogey form, not guilty, in quotation marks. I'm a little evergreen that can regenerate itself, made an officer of high rank in biblical times with the duty of filling the king's cup and presenting it to him. Of Don's era and a unit of length equal to half the width of an atom, kicking my limbs about. <laughs> so it's completely balmy, but it was a lot of fun. <laughs> Very good. Oh good. And you could, yeah. I, I mean, you could take, some of those words have several different translations, so you could make something quite different. The only thing it doesn't is angstrom, which is a unit of length which is very tiny and happens to be half the width of an atom. There is, uh, an atom is two angstroms wide. Or a man's name. Or a man, yes, Angstrom. it's a man's name too, because the unit was called after the man's name. That's true, mm -hmm. you could have it as the man's name. But it was it was silly probably, but it, once I'd started oh, delving in, great. it was just fun. Very, very helpful. <laughs> <laughs> Spuma is foam. I knew I knew that word from yeah. the French. It's yeah, so, Spumoni. Italian. Oh my God. So mm -hmm. how does she make this richer than Dunn's? Obviously, yeah, yeah, Jenny yeah. has made this much richer than, <laughs> than Lanny's. Um, but how, how does this human on human, how does this enrich these, this, these, this, these what we're thinking about? That's a good question, Barry. Any anybody want to uh, attempt an answer? I was very interested because the other thing I did was compared it to the Dun all the way down the Dun, and I don't know if I've still got the notes of that. But most of the words um, did relate to something in the Dun. Angstrom, obviously not, because he and the unit weren't there in Dun's time. <laughs> but a lot of the others did, which quite surprised me. Um, but I think I think it's richer in lots of ways. But then that I'm not a big fan of Elizabethan sonnets, really. So, and Dunn's Dunn is such a hmm, what's the word I want? He's sort of obsessed with himself and his feeling that he's not worthy. So he's got this kind of becoming an Angl Anglican, but not worthy to be an Anglican because of his misspent youth, and then becoming a priest because other people pushed him to and becoming a very good priest, but still not believing in himself. So he's, they're kind of angst-ridden things. And, and this one's the same, you know, it's, it's, he's not good enough for himself. But he starts with this, so I've, I posted this first text. I mean, he starts with this very interesting claim, right? I am a little world made cunningly of elements in an angelic sprite. Um, and I, and then it goes on, yeah, as you're saying, Jenny, it kind of goes on into this sort of like more or less typical self-flagellating thing about, you know, the sin, the darkness of the sin, blah, 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 right? Mm -hmm. um, and, but so, so I think you know, it's like what... Laney is sticking with here is just that opening, right? This this idea of being um, a little world made cunningly of elements and an angelic sprite. Um, this this sort of creation story, right? And I mean, actually, I think that I am a little world made cunningly is a rather like when it's when it's taken out of context feels very modern and mod -phobian, like dare we say Dickinsonian, something like that, right? Like there is this, there is this power in 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 smallness that's being evoked. I'm a little world made cunningly, this kind of cosmologic cos cos there must be a difference between cosmic and cosmological. <laughs> I want to go with cosmological. <laughs> Um, insofar as right. other related just... to, a cosmo uh, to, to a cosmos or, or, or something. 
Do you want to make it? Want to make it more out of this world? Is that what you're trying to do? <laughs> no, no. I want to. I want to talk. It's there, there's a sort of um, a sort of theory of a system here. There's a little. It's a little world made cunningly. There's all the little elements that that fit together. Oh. Um, ah. And that that. Yeah. Uh, and then he keeps a minute orb, which you could see as a little world right. in the second. Right. No, well, no, 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 no. He, he keeps a liturgy in the first one, which isn't in the done, but it does relate to him as a person, if you like. Mm -hmm. so, okay, hold on a minute. What is a worsted? Uh, um, worsted could be a verb, but don't we call... Um, it's a, a worsted it's a sweater. It's a fabric. It's a fabric. Yeah. It's a fabric. It's a fine right, so worsted. Yeah. Full fabric. So it's a fabric, and liturgy is the adjective. I am a little world. I am a, a fabric that is made into a liturgy that is liturgical. Wow. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> uh, Terry, I, I don't think you were wrong um, right from from the start. Um, it it looks like like a verb, and I'm sure that Lenny Brown is playing with language. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think so yeah. too. Yeah, and I did use it as a verb when I made my little translation. Mm -hmm. Because yeah, it, you did. It but makes what's... sense, a verb, but actually, worsted fabric was incredibly different. Di what's the word? incredibly important to the British economy in Elizabethan times. Mm. So so was so I think she is playing with words. Um and then she brings spumoni, which is like ice cream. Hmm? Spumoni, yes. yeah. Well yes. Italian um, ice cream as an homage yeah. to Petrarch. Yes. Inventor of, of the sonnet. That's great. Spum what was that also... about ice cream? Hmm? Spumoni has, has three levels. has three levels. Three, three. Yes. So that would mean three levels in in this. And uh, if you don't count, if you don't count the nuts. Mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. And uh, it's different colored. It's like different. The words could be material, material with three different threads, three different threads pulled together. Mm -hmm. Worsted. Worsted by their three couplets. Right. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> I just think powder. Oh, it's big up this, yeah. Does it doesn't spum uh, spumoni mean something like like foam, like spumante, or or does anybody speak Italian? <laughs> um <laughs> like there wasn't I, any other translation than ice cream in the dictionaries, but spume yeah. is part of foam, I agree. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. There's we have similar words in, in, in English, right? Like um yeah, I mean, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I'm just basing this on Chipomante, which is like a kind of like Prosecco, right? Which is, I think, the, the name is something like yeah. Foam or something like that, right? So um, I think. Uh, espuma is uh, my foam roof. I have to say, Espuma. Uh, okay, okay. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think the foaminess, though, that you kind of get, I think that fits with this sort of microcosmic thing going on, right? I'm, I am a. I'm, She's taking the I'm the little world made cunningly and she's becoming a liturgy worsted. I mean, the worsted wool, right? It's 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 or the mm -hmm. worsted fabric is made from very small wool threads. Mm -hmm. there's, there's, and it also it's, says it's stapled, it's stapled wool. What does that mean? Stapled. Stapled wool? Yeah, so it, that's what worsted says right here. Yeah, and, but that's the wool with the staple on it, so that you don't smooth it as much as you do for some other wool. Oh, oh, okay. So okay. the staples are some of the fibers. So it's what it really is is scratchy wool. If you had it next to your skin, it'd be scratchy like my school Sunday sacks when I was at boarding school. It's like so, it's like John the Baptist with his hair shirt, right? Something like that. Yes, that's, <laughs> I think my. My Sunday dresses at boarding uh -huh. school were made of it because they were so itchy. <laughs> oh yeah, so it's 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 a the <laughs> liturgy is yeah the liturgy is the language um, is what the definition Jenny and was uh, something you know it's the thing we're all praying together and that is the that's scratching <laughs> this this body that you're talking about Max that's foamy and elixir liquid 
Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, I keep thinking about the, um, if Spoonie has like three layers and if we read the three couplets as the three layers, can we also just say that the poem is talking to us in a way? It's like, I am, um, that the I am means the poem is instead of the speaker is. Um, maybe in that way we can, I, I didn't, didn't think about that before, but that made me um, kind of, realize that it doesn't have to be the speaker it can also just be the poem maybe yeah that's that's a good point we haven't yeah we haven't even addressed the yeah. audio yet which is which feels like such a good starting point for this but to totally and i think that's also extremely fitting with the the kind of conceptual poetic philosophy right like and also with with the n plus kinds of of procedures right we're going to we're going to kill the author, right? Like I is, you know, we're going to take John Donne, who is, seems to have a strong sense of who he is and what he wants to proclaim. And Lainey's going to take that and, and be like, okay, we're going to chop this up, mix it up. And it's going to become, yeah, totally. It was actually this kind of like, this more of a textual phenomenon. Um, I mean, any any thoughts on this idea, on, on the eye here, the, the poem? Um, I would also like to include uh, liturgy. Um, it also means order. It uh, sets the rules um, how to celebrate the mass. And here it also sets rules how to write um, the perfect sonnet. Um, maybe the um, the sonnet is really speaking here, saying I am uh, the, the one who sets um, the rules. Um, I have to consist of 14 lines, it has to be pentameter, it has to have a certain rhyme scheme. Or it is um, uh, Lenny Brown saying, um, I give the new rules what a sonnet should be. Yeah. And just the, the fact that it's a sonnet already adds to the intertextuality, but then including John Don definitely does as well. So he's echoed in the I am as well. Or just any sonnet writer, um, kind of, and then even Jenny, you edit a new layer um, just by writing yourself. Have we started answering yeah. um, Terry's question um, whether um, the, the sonnet improves the tradition of sonneteering <laughs> or sonnet writing? I see it as a completely different thing. Really, it's it. Um... I can't see how so. to compare a banana so. with an apple in a way. You know, I think the sonnets are perfectly good form, and it has its own constraints. And instead of experimenting on on the sonnet, it just seems to be something new apart. And I wouldn't, I, with all due respect to Lainey Brown, I prefer to have the two kinds of sonnets with their form because it's a challenge. To, it's not easy to write a, a sonnet series. But I think what she calls in her notes, generative experimentation, moving about in 14 lines, that's quoting Lenny Brown. But okay, she could generate all by herself with 14 lines without calling it a sonnet. I, I think uh, I think it's off. I, I don't really like the experiment. Mm -hmm. I think What's it's the sure. of these 14 lines. Um, we all learn at school, a sonnet consists of 14 lines, but uh, when we have a look at Shakespeare, he wrote 154 sonnets. Two sonnets have only 12 lines. Okay. Two and one sonnet has even 15 lines, one more. And we consider Shakespeare as the greatest sonneteers of all times. So um, it is allowed to um, bury these numbers. Um, the sonnet is mm -hmm. a very condensed form, 14 lines, that's quite short. And here we have Lainey Brown who succeeds in writing a sonnet that's even shorter, that is um, round about um, half the length size of, of the sonnet. After all, Shakespeare also used um, half sonnets in Roman Juliet. He has a quadrant plus a couplet. And he also used in, 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 in his uh, dramas, uh, in, in, in his plays, um, sonnet-like like forms that only have six lines. And we have to remember that sonnets were being written before Shakespeare. 
right. didn't invent them. And like, I don't know anything about what they were like, but I do know that they existed. There's Petrarch. Oh, are they, they, they came uh, almost Petrarch. at the same time as uh, William Shakespeare. Um, it was uh, Thomas Wyatt who introduced um, the Italian sonnet into uh, England, into the English language. And th that was a few decades before Shakespeare. Mm. Thank you. And, and then there was also um, Sir Philip Sidney and Edmund Spencer. They were the great sonneteers before Shakespeare. Also contemporaries of Shakespeare. Right, right. I I love the line, little live, I'm a little live oak made cup bearer, because um, that again goes to the form. Like she's, she's saying that she's, I mean, it's that the tradition is not a dead one. It's a live oak, a live oak. And she's made cup bearer. Uh, aren't the cups and the, the chalices in churches sometimes made of wood, wooden goblets? But the, but cup bearers were very specific, historical, um, thing biblical things. Biblical, yeah, yeah. They they were in effect, the the very important person who delivered the wine to the king, and presumably tasted it first to make sure he didn't drop dead. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, so sure cup bearers mind. might have come might be used in church services as well, but <laughs> but originally with that. But if they're used in church services as well, then that's an interesting double meaning of the word, isn't it? Yeah. I I I, re I also uh, really like this last this last uh, couplet, Vijaya. Um, uh, for several reasons. Uh, one, I think I think it offers, um, or it really puts forth the the theory of the sonnet that that um, uh, Laney wants to to wants to, to to conceptualize here right um and i think i, I think we we sh i think uni is right and we need to to read these ims as being uh you know the the sonnet speaking the poem speaking and then we can read it as like like you know it's laney's it's not laney saying i am a little live oak but it's 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 lady being like this is what a this is what a sonnet is right and if we can mm -hmm. uh, you know, maybe a sonnet is a little live oak of something so the poet the poem is sort of speaking and trying to and kind of theorizing itself and this yeah. also this goes a little bit to um to to mark's point about the historical variation in sonnet lengths yeah. um and right so so like if 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 we all are taught that a sonnet is 14 lines and then you somebody shows you something that's six lines and is like oh yeah but this is a sonnet then we, what is so then what what is it about a sonnet you know beyond the the number of lines that qualifies it as a sonnet is there something poetic is there something aesthetic is there something um meta is there is there something that 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 qualifies a sonnet as a sonnet beyond the 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 strictures around the numbers of lines um and I think I think it does actually come down to this idea of that we've been talking about quite a bit already, of um, you know compression, the idea of the poem being able to fit on a page, the idea of there's a sort of tidiness to the fourteen lines, um, right? That there's something about the sonnet that is you know a little world made cunningly, as Dunn says. Um, and here in this last uh, this last couplet, I am a little live oak. So here we have little, right? We have little little comes back. It's left in. I'm a little live oak made cup bearer, um, which is, as we're saying now, a somewhat an important but somewhat humble role, right? Um, uh, of Elizabethan and Angstrom sprawl. So we have we have these two now um, competing adjectives, Elizabethan sort of, you know, historicizing the sonnet as a, a form that's very important for Elizabethan times, and Angstrom, right, bringing it into a, essentially quantum physics maybe somebody wants to correct me my use of my invocation of quantum physics here but but uh, right the angstrom is being a subatomic unit yeah. of measurement and there's there's again this like mm, mm, there's this mm, tininess that's being evoked this 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 smallness this idea of of compression of of something that's that's so small yet so foundational um to 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 everything to to the sprawl you know the angstrom sprawl that's 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 also the spreading wide my narrow hands to gather paradise right mm -hmm. this idea of the it's also a contradiction just as yeah. done has angelic sprite which is a contradiction 
Oh, the angelic sprite. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. No, a sprite's a mischievous goblin kind of thing, and a an angelic. And here she's got angstrom and small, which are contradictions as well, really, aren't they? Yeah, I mean, yeah, elements. Yeah, the elements. Well, elements and angelic sprite. Though, these are already right, like Elizabethan and angstrom. These are already sort of of, of contradictions and and opposing terms, right? He's saying like. I done in the original saying I am a world made cunningly of elements and angelic sprite with being like, you know, I'm made of like, you know, bones and physical things and, and stuff like that, but it's it, I'm animated, you know, I'm brought to life by by the spirit. Um and so you yeah. know playing in that in that 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 kind of complicated uh space, right? Like of, of being like I'm I'm a body, but I'm also like a soul, right? Uh and and so Blaney's playing with that even light. Hmm? Light. Angstrom is what we use to describe light. Uh, and mm -hmm. this was light in so many, so many angstroms. So okay. it's the sprawl of light. I am a I you were I am a and I just said light. <laughs> light. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Oh. Light. It's measured in angstroms. Right? It, Yarun? Uh, yeah, the, the, the length of the, the the wavelength of light is in the angstrom uh, scale. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm just looking. It's it's a unit of length equal to one ten billionth of a meter. So yeah. pretty small. <laughs> um, For me, the word the word "life" is very significant because what she's saying is that if you stick to the what has gone before, that if you stick only to the fourteen lines. It's like a dead tradition, but I'm the one who's making it mm. live, right? Yeah. This is like a living tradition. You, If you just follow what the people previously are doing, then, I mean, that becomes like a dead tradition. It's like, you know, it's it's hardened. So you, so, and then, of course, then she moves on to the atomic kind of thing, like, yeah. inside us of, Oh, Mary, what do you think of what what do you think of what Vijaya is saying? I, I, I'm, I'm, I think maybe an angstrom sprawl means that she she personally thinks that she uh, her distance to the normal sonnet is very small. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. That's that's nice. Yeah. Isn't an oak a very old tree, or they they can get old? Yeah, they can do that. Really um, oak, oaks uh, look better the the older they are. Similar to to the sonnet, which mm. is quite old, and it looks more and more beautiful. Yeah, more attractive. Nice. Yeah. I, I mean the the romantics they were fascinated by by the sonnet, um, Victorians. And the question is, what about uh, the twentieth century? Is it still a genre? in which our poets should write. And I think here, Lenny Brown in the 21st century says um, it is the right yes. genre. It's yeah. little, it small, yeah. it only yeah. has 14 lines and yeah. I present something that is even um, shorter than uh, 14 lines. Um, it's still living, it's still alive and it's like a wonderful old oak. Yes, yes, because uh, I walk near the lake here and the oak, they, they, they sprawl out, uh, you know, over the trail and they bend towards the water on the lake and it's beautiful. It's like they are like canopies kind of, so yeah. Oh, we do not have these wonderful oaks. <laughs> Terry <laughs> that one. Yeah, that is beautiful. No, we don't have those either. Live oak is the name of the tree. Is it also um, the small tree. Look like a, a family oh. tree? And um, she refers to, to the tradition of, of the sonnet. I'm part of that oh. family tree of sonneteers. Yeah. Oh. Yes. <laughs> she's she's kind of also, um, yeah, the, Just uh, saying, um, yeah. well, the, the, the oldest tree is um, probably... Um, the tree of, of knowledge uh, from Genesis of oh. where Adam and Eve uh, got uh, the fruit from and um, the, the fall of man, a uh, kind of beginning of mankind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And more descriptive than the word world, little world, 
little live oak. Mm. The yeah. live oaks are very big trees, aren't they, when they get full size? Oh. Yes. Um, the they're not tall. They go this way, and but they live for a really long time. Mm. Big, yes, but wide, more wide than, you know, than the redwoods mm -hmm. from where Vrijaya is from. So how does this, so this, this sort of celebration or appreciation of the sonnet form that we're seeing here, uh, at least with this done sonnet, the 614th sonnet, I mean, how does this, is this consistent across the other ones? I mean, if we take a look at the subsequent one, 214th sonnet, which is just two lines, this undressing at security checkpoints would never have gone over with the Victorians. I mean, what kind of theory of the sonnet are we encountering now? Is it, if, if we understand these in some ways to be meta sonnets that are all in some way invested in theorizing the sonnet form, um, what can, what conclusions can we draw now? I mean, so we have, we've been talking, you know, we, we've, we've done a really good job of things sort of uh, glossing what is in fact a, a, a somewhat difficult or, or sort of at times seemingly nonsensical poem and, and kind of drawing out you know, these different sorts of value judgments and, and these kinds of evocations, right? You know, we're just talking here about the, the little live oak, which is actually a rather lovely image. Um, but here, this undressing at security checkpoints would never have gone over with the Victorians. I mean, what's the... Is, is the, there a Victorian sonnet? Yeah. Is Spencer yeah, Victorian yeah. Spencer? I oh, I, I would have started with uh, Shakespeare again. Um, the sonnet itself um, starts as a tradition of love poetry. Um, that's uh, what Petrarca um, created. And uh, it took a while until Shakespeare took over and he changed the topics to time. And the sonnet here also is about time. We have two references to time, first to, to the Victorians, and then the checkpoints, um, which it's to modern, me very um, marks uh, 9, 9 11 or post 9 11. So she yeah. is addressing these um, two points in, in time. And of course, also the Victorians, um, they rediscovered um, the sonnet and they also had their sonnet cycles. That's yeah. I mean that that's that's a great contextualization, Mark, of the with the the temporal theme of 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 sonnets. Right. We have the nine the post nine eleven uh, invocation with security checkpoints. Victorian. And then also the the fun that is behind it. Can you imagine a Victorian person at a at a checkpoint? Yeah, right, right. I, I laughed at first. Yeah. Oh my god, everyone would uh miss the plane. <laughs> <laughs> no, there would be an outrage by the woman. You know, you know, the Victorian would hold up, hold up a long line of people. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, to do it as a modern thing, so you could just, could you see, it could be the comic movie where they're addressing like that and out comes, you know, a, a, you know, a, a whip or something and other <laughs> weird things that they've hidden under all this, you know, the little derringer. So the Victorians would not like us undressing the sonnet? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. yeah, I think that's how I read it as well. Um, like undressing and just in the sense of shortening it, maybe in a way, what she did before with the sonnet 60 or 614, the dance sonnet. Um, I mean, they were really, even though Mark, you were right, they weren't really like Shakespeare did stuff that wasn't 14 lines long. Um, but still, like the sonnet is a pretty strict form. And even today, like, um, of course, you are encouraged to kind of play with the form, but if it's it looks like a sonnet I think there's still people that would really like to have it as a 14 line thing with iambic pentameter and everything um and even like especially the Victorians would not have liked that and it's great that it's uh it's not just undressing it's undressing at security checkpoints it's, it's really making the uh the need for shortening as something that is uh not even voluntary but it's it's uh 
something that is required of us nowadays. So that's that brings a, a heaviness to it. I I link it to sky writings. Mm, you know? yeah. Isn't it? It's like because it's but, like nowadays travel is something of almost a necessity for work and for other matters. I mean, it's like so basic. We have to, it's like during the Victorians, I'm sure they didn't travel that much. If at all they traveled, they traveled only short distances. Yeah, or by or by steamship or, you know, like, yeah, yeah, it was, it was definitely different. Um, and I, I doubt if there were that many security checkpoints either. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, there's, there's an interesting... There's definitely an observation being made here around like the idea of security as 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 a necessity, and that you know as we're saying now is actually a, a relatively um, recent phenomenon. Um, and the fact that we are a global village that yeah, it's and that's not right. just the Victorian. Like I mean, here we are. We are talking. We are all from different countries, and we are talking about poetry in English, right? <laughs> But it's like it's across so many checkpoints, like if we really have to meet in a room, kind of. But there's yeah, the, the global village is that's 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 yeah. such a good way to put it, which I have but because you know, right, the 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 frequency of air travel and the banality of it in the 21st century, right, is really, a pro you know, it's 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 very much tied up with globalization, which is a very different sort of world system or world order than the one the Victorians would have been familiar with, which was yeah. the of empire. Um, and so, you know, you have this where, where, where you, you, know, you may, as a Victorian of enough means, you know, travel to the, to the imperial, uh, to, to the colonies, to the imperial colonies, world. right, yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, but, but you, you know, today we're sort of bouncing around and there's, there's, so there's a few different things that are being invoked here, really. What, yeah. what is shocking the, the Victorians yeah. Well, right? like, like, a the undressing at the security checkpoints, right? Because of the different sort of conventions and Max, well, also just, the, the, the ease or the, the 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 different the different relations of, of of countries and world powers, right? I think that's perhaps yeah. something as well. Max, look at look at you, kid from New Jersey, and you're in you're in Berlin writing yeah. a paper on on freeways in, in the United States. You know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean. <laughs> That's called global global village, right there. Yeah, yeah, no, for 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 sure. Um, so I, Brian, I'd like hmm? I'd like to say yeah. that Victorian yeah. times, the individuals traveling, they were traveling probably in coaches pulled by horses, and they need individual security because there were so many robberies there was so it was very dangerous to travel in the victorian times so security has a whole different meaning yes you know, yes yeah and that was all about hiding your money under layers of clothing and things like that wasn't it yeah so quite the opposite to our checkpoint lock and all the secret <laughs> pockets in the skirts and well, where this, you, hmm. and i wonder if lanny brown knows what she started here you know <laughs> Um, but yes, it, but, but it's uh, con conditional. It, it says, uh, "Would never have gone." It it doesn't say they 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 went through these um checkpoints. Um, security checkpoints. To me, that's clear that these are our modern post nine eleven checkpoints. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hey, and Mark. Sorry, I I was just going to ask about the idea of the tone of. Uh, the speaker, I think Yunia started this in about the top one that, that you said it was love poems and it, would it be the speaker as the poet expressing love for someone in the in the first part, the first 12 lines and then the couplet is usually kind of a summation or something. There's a, there's a um, for, for content, there's something traditional in the sonnet, isn't there? Mm -hmm. The Volta, yeah, there's... Yes, um, there, there are two, two traditions okay. of uh, sonnets. Um, the Petrarchan or Italian tradition has the octave and the sestet. And it's more like a scale. You have an argument and a counter-argument. The Shakespeare, um, the English sonnet tradition, that's different. You have three quadrants and you have a development. 
And after the first two quadrants, you have the turn or the volta. And that leads to the third quadrant, and then finally a summary in, in the couplet. And I think what we have here is a fractional um, English sonnet, a Shakespearean sonnet. The three quadrants are missing, and there is this development before, and she summarizes that in, in this couplet, and it certainly is a couplet, because you have um, these, the, uh -huh. this A.A. Uh, a. rhyme scheme, checkpoints, Victorians. Okay, not really a rhyme, but it's it's quite close uh, to, to rhyme. And what's missing is the undressing of these three quadrants before. Mm. So again, I would say this is a wonderful song. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, you were waving Lainey's book, I think. Yes. But does she have oh. sonnets of all sorts of different lengths in it? Because yes, in um, England, you can't, you can't, you know, bookshops don't stock it, so there's no way of seeing it. You've either got to buy it or not buy it. And I'm just quite curious as to what else is in it. Does she have a, a lot of sonnets of different lengths? What proportion of them are by her children and things like that? Yes, uh, the, the sonnets are of uh, different lengths. And I think uh, what L scanned for Motpo, um for uh, sonnets, uh, he, you can see that they have different lengths. Yes, but the, other oh. than the six and the two, she mm. would write in other different lengths as well. Right. Mm. That's what I'm asking. Does she, does she yeah. has like an eight, an eight fourteen sonnet, or like a seven fourteen, or does she have like a? Yeah, that's my question, Max. Yeah, because we have the two, the six, and then we have the two four. In the extras, we also have the fourteen liners. But if you have the book in front of you, Mark, is there one that's Mark? Would um, you would on, you on read next, one? Next page. Um, this is a sonnet that really looks like a sonnet. You yeah. have three quadrants and and a couplet. I would you read, read it. it? Would you read it for us? Read one, open, anywhere. <laughs> Maybe that that one. Sonnet of Baron Mark Sally's Longchamp. Is it French? I don't know. Um, Eskidian Heart manifests its presence by noise, noises, knockings, a polite tangle of speech, temperature below that of incandescent, Etruscan rooms lacking thought, a circular disc, usually wooden with metal rim, for discreet distance, a rumor or price of gossip often untrue, a sheet of white paper blotched and scrawled, dearest secret, exquisitely wretched, flintly impenetrable embryo blossoms, voice read white-tipped, thoughts of love, one, one thousand to be well, one balm, corrosive, visitude, tears of tea. Okay, so um, <laughs> no... <laughs> Real rhyme scheme. Mm -hmm. and what is that one? Is, what, is does that one have a name? Hmm? Does that one have a name or number or whatever? Well, they're, they're all numbered. Uh, it starts with uh, number one and oh. it ends with um, 151. Shakespeare had uh, 154. I think she tried to be as close to Shakespeare um, as she could mm. possibly get. Isn't that also a phenomenon um, in symphony writing that Beethoven is the great example, the great model, and all the others um, tried to be below nine symphonies? Right, right, right. Uh, yeah. to, to but that was, a, that was a great example of the global village having a German try to read Lenny Brown. <laughs> <laughs> you did a good job, by the way. <laughs> Well, and I think Lenny is experimenting with so many things. The only yeah. book I have is the poet's novel. And, you know, it's not the length of a novel. It's a, a, a this is the only book I have of hers. Um, but now I want yes, to. Yes, get... and, and she also says um, that, that she has no time writing these texts because she has to care for her children. Um, that's one reason why she calls these poems uh, daily sonnets. And even uh, this uh, 214 sonnet, um, probably yeah. she only had time writing to do uh, this, this couplet. Yeah. And mm. 
writing a couplet certainly takes a takes a lot of time, uh, especially yeah, the this, such yeah, a wonderful um, a couplet. Yeah, this one is Which a. Uh, Vijay, can you can you hold it closer? Yeah. Ah, this is a lovely book. It's a uh, beautiful, mm, lots of lists, and they're just amazing. It's also very experimental. Just she makes the whole. She's dedicated it to CD Wright, a mentor. Mm. Mm. Um, they just short lines, like, and I think she's numbered it by date. Yeah, you know? so it's like the daily takes too much time. <laughs> uh, the second one is uh, the second in the list, and she's like. Uh, numbered them. So this was the second one is, therefore, I propose to waking every second, beginning each moment. Uh, nice. The new year is just an excuse for counting. That's <laughs> great. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Back to to the daily sonnets. I, I think that's uh, such a wonderful project. Well, I I read um, Lenny Brown's uh, sonnet when I first um, took Modpo, and then I also read uh, read them a second time, and I thought, okay, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. But uh, when I reread them this week, I was so fascinated by these wonderful poems because um, I. I was reflecting on what he was really doing, uh, taking Dunn, who wrote holy sonnets, um, starting a new tradition. I write religious topics in, in, in my sonnets. And then we have Lainey Brown, who says, I write daily sonnets. Mm -hmm. What um, uh, John Dunn can, I can the same, I can it even better. And here she starts writing about her daily life, um, about your inspirations that came uh, during the, the day. Um, it also influenced um, her, her writing um, when there was no time writing a complete sonnet. She wrote only um, this a fractional fraction. number yeah. of, of lines and even having a 614th sonnet. Isn't it great? Shakespeare also wrote um, half sonnets in Roman Juliet, one of his best um, plays. And then also um, writing this couplet for the 214th sonnet and then having the sonnet undressing itself, um, <laughs> which is quite typical for the 21st se uh, century, where the reader has to get active and um, create the art. It's well, well put, Mark. I think, I think that, yeah, the, 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 mm -hmm reframing of the done holy sonnet to the daily sonnet is 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 very much an encapsulation of this kind of contemporary conceptual poetic practice uh you know and it's something we, we encounter elsewhere in different poems and different um units right like the uh poetry becoming a becoming like work or becoming a kind of necessity becoming this sort of quotidian thing that's not only a tool for observing the everyday but is 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 um enfolded into the everyday as a sort of uh as a way of of thinking a way of being a way of of making and and even potentially a way of 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 working or surviving or something like that and yeah, and hence, hence this really like quotidian observation here in this second one about the, 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 the undressing at the security um, checkpoints, right? And this, this sort of like theorizing of the sonnet as, as, as something that has, still has something to say in the present, potentially, um, even if it feels so, as a form, it feels so deterritorialized from the periods in which it was most popular, you know, from the Elizabethans to the, to the Victorians, obviously the several centuries there in between. Um, but, you know, like these 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 different times, right, where where perhaps our own, uh, our world would seem alien to these people, but we still like, their form still has something to say. It's the, it's the little live oak, right, that that's kind of... Mm. 
that's growing and, and sort of branching out and, 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 and there's, and again, I think it comes down as we see here in the second one, it comes down to this, this, this thing about compression, about, about, you know, the sonnet being essentially, the sonnet's not an epic, right? I mean, so like Spencer also wrote like these like massive, well, I mean, the fairy queen, you know, he wrote the fairy queen, which is like this gigantic epic poem, like this, this, this allegorical epic, but then you know you wrote all this sonnet. So there's something that the value of the sonnet is being like as being fundamentally about constraint is kind of interesting, um, and and something that I think she wants to, to to really hold on to, bring into the present this idea of constraint and tie it back to a longer tradition of constraint rather than saying that like because she's you know she's working in this sort of experimental uh, or conceptual poetic world right where there's a lot about constraint and there's this lot of ideas that like. Like, you know, we're going to, you can only, you have to, you can only write poems through N plus seven or, you know, there's all these different like con Olympian constraints, right? Uh, and in some ways she's, she wants to like uncover the longer tradition of that, I think. Like, and be like, you know, constraint has been essential to poetry all along. Um, it's not something that was just invented like in the sixties by some people in France. Like it was actually, you know, it's been, it's been there for forever uh, and it has a value and it's essential to, to poetics. Um, well, and Max, let's think about what it is, what poetry is doing today, um, where that the Fairy Queen was, t you know, radio or TV for the for the, yeah, those yeah. folks, and these things were the you know the the real gems, you know, the the Ben Franklin proverbs where there was the long, long the stories that people could read to one another around a camp, you know, a hearth. And so here we have so much TV and video and YouTube. And so then she's just got to get to the sonnet, the pith, you know. I was, I was thinking uh, when, you, uh, when you go back to the holy sonnets that you can also look at it very humanistic. Right? When, where, or what is the most holy uh, that we have nowadays when we're uh, a little short on religion? It's the daily life of the people, and that's mm -hmm. especially so when she starts quoting her children. That you really have the, the, the most holy thing there is 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 the daily life, the the the, the way uh, generations grow up. That's mm -hmm. yeah, that's 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 a good point. The sort of secularization as well as the planet. Um, Vijaya, you posted in the chat referring to undressing to the way we close read is a great idea. Being open would be anathema to the victorians would they like close reading that's uh i mean i guess it would depend on which victorians you you asked <laughs> um uh yeah i mean close reading as we as we practice it now is is a uh, 20th century um development uh but there's of course other forms of interpretation that would have been more familiar in the 19th century um textual interpretation another thought that that i had um the the checkpoint isn't that something like a ready-made mm -hmm. uh ready-made like uh, as in um about i said you trump uh having this urinal or what uh have you and making art out of it um what what about um the the checkpoint isn't that something ordinary boring no one is really interested in it and here we have lenny prawn saying oh it's worth as um the the matter for for a sonnet yeah um the the best form in in poetry and she she presents this it's uh to us that's yeah that's 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 a yeah, that's a good observation i mean the security checkpoint is a kind of daily ritual akin to the to the writing of daily sonnets um it's, it's ordinary, ordinary. <laughs> and, and and she makes it uh extraordinary um even by uh uh associating that of uh, with the victorians and that wonderful joke but yeah maybe... this this daily thing there are these um these uh euphemisms that we're used to that na have this other meaning uh, you know cuz security was a different meaning somewhere else checkpoint you know, there was Checkpoint Charlie and there were other things like that. But now we know everybody puts this picture, security checkpoint, 
we know what that means. That's mm -hmm. at the airport kind of we thing it's airport, because yeah. it's associated with the undressing. So taking these things that we've made into the urinal, the thing, this object that we don't even want to discuss because it's so ordinary, to bring those those pictures to use that is, I love your analogy that it's a, a ready-made, that that's what Duchamp was doing, was sticking these things that we never look at, we try to, not to look at really, in front of us. And yeah, she's doing that. Wow, that's great. Yeah, there's also and that. and it's really our modern words uh, or contemporary word. It's it's not a train station. It's not ever a pound. Um, what's that? Uh, at station of of the metro. Oh, it's quite similar. So I have to write two lines, and that is the couplet. And I will do with the sonnet what Ezra Pound did with the haiku. And he wasn't ambitious enough to to write a sonnet on it, but only this <laughs> haiku. The, the other thing about the checkpoint is they say, would you prefer to be in a private room? I, I have artificial mm -hmm. hips and, you know, I always set off all the alarms and I say, whatever you're going to do to me, do right here in front of everyone, <laughs> you know, do not take me behind closed doors because that feels so much like, Guatemala or some other place. <laughs> yeah. Oh, but, <laughs> right. <laughs> so, but, um, oh, it, it, it is a private room because we do not know what really happens when Victorian <laughs> comes uh, to to the checkpoint, and she invites us to imagine what would happen if this uh, uh, conditional would never have gone over with the Victorians. It's yes. also. The imagination, she, she invites us to, to imagine something, to, to enter the world of poetry. I have no time writing the sonnet properly. You do. You do. <laughs> I'm dressing. <laughs> well, um, I'm watching this, or I just watched a series on Prime that uh, about the clothing of, the, you know, of the old kings and all of this and the many layers and just it's so it would be so hard to check yeah, <laughs> i mean i course. just made me burst out laughing um at those two lines um but the i wonder why she didn't say shakespearean or petrarchan she says victorian so i'm kind of wondering whether like you know it also relates to imperialism and that they did not yeah. bother with security points for other countries. They just went and grabbed all the other countries. And would that? Yes. And 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 our our I mean our whole concept of security checkpoints in the airport is based on these sorts of imperial prejudices to begin with, right? Like we all know who gets checked more at uh, yes. security checkpoints than other people, right? So there is this there is there is a very Victorian idea built in there. Max, we know, we know who's hijack planes and put bombs on planes too yes there's so it's not necessarily the imperial attitude but mm -hmm. because of democracy because of uh that we all travel together we're no longer saying only the people with enough money to get on the top of the plane because we kept every the poor people were in steerage they were down locked down below and so we didn't have to worry about them. They could have gangs and knife fights and whatever down there. But the upper class were separated. So separate by separating, we didn't need to have those checkpoints. You didn't need to do that. Only the people with enough money to get in there, who we assume are going to be genteel. <laughs> I'm sure there were some knife fights too. So anyway, <laughs> that's the point. What's interesting about this two-line one, is you don't need anything else. She's done enough in two yeah, lines. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. But as you were sat here talking about it for however long, mm -hmm. and you don't need to add anything. Yeah. Which is but amazing, I, isn't it? The, the perfect sonnet is short. <laughs> and <laughs> how short can, can you get as uh, two lines? Yeah, yeah. That's about, it's about as... And, and the couplet. A couplet. Yes. <laughs> Uh, and look, Mary is Mary is smiling. She's getting this. She was a doubter to begin with that that this was a, a more interesting could be a more interesting sonnet than a classical one. What do you think, Mary? 
<laughs> so you are you're an agreement, right? <laughs> um, you're on that note, with the, oh, on, on that note, with the time we have left, maybe we should take a look at the at the other um uh poem. I know, I'm trying. Sorry. Uh, which I just posted in the chat here. It's Rachel Loden's "I Know a Brand." Um. Another week in my pope. Actually, Max, could we could we maybe have a a quick round of um, final words? Oh yeah, sure, sure, go for it. I then. mean, I mean, we let, um, after we talked to I know a brand, but if we could just go around and everybody say, you know, a uh, a two word haiku or something. I don't know. Uh, does anybody want to what on on the daily sonnets? Standing, it, thank what, you. what final words? What's that? Oh, Loved fun. it. Thank you. Ah, yeah. <laughs> Loved it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> wow. I'll, I'll just say, wow. This is this has been an incredible, incredible mod post season, especially the office hours. And um, Thanks, that's my you. final word. <laughs> I I like the what we're what we're talking about here with the security checkpoints i think i think it's really fascinating that's giving me a lot to, to i don't know I, I think the security security checkpoint at the airport is a bit like the sonnet a kind of living and evolving ritual uh mm -hmm. insofar as every time you go through it it's going to be a little bit different mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i think yes. it's, a sh it's a shame we didn't uh uh I have time for the, the other two because uh, there you have the uh, two mentioning of the, the caterpillar, which is something that uh, makes a metamorphosis. More, uh, metamorphosis, sorry. <laughs> and uh, I think that's a, a great uh, image uh, to have in mind when you look at the many forms that Eleni uh, puts uh, uh, a sonnet into. Thank mm -hmm. you.